Okay, let's choose up. I'll take Jamal and Tutal. You can have Chubbs and Skippy. Let's go. My ball. Okay. But you got skins. Not a good negotiator? You don't have to be a good negotiator at McCarthy Chevrolet. McCarthy guarantees the lowest prices on a new Chevy or we'll pay you $10,000. We guarantee there's no need to shop any place else. McCarthy Chevrolet, I-35 and Santa Fe, Olathe. Welcome back to Track Talk here on Sports Radio 810 WHB. It's the Racing Boys, and joining us now on the show is Mike Bagley, one of my favorite guys over there at XM90. Can't miss him every morning. Mike, how you doing, my friend? Morning, boys. How we doing over in Kansas City this morning? We're surviving, my friend. We are surviving, and uh, the season is winding down. So I think, like yourself, we've been out on the road working hard, trying to cover this our sport and get it out to the people. But, uh, you know, that wall is right in front of me, Mike. I'm just about ready to hit that wall any moment. You know what I mean? Come on, son. Suck it up. we got about a month and a half to go. you got a little bit left in you. You can't be giving up all this just yet now. Well, I've been out on the road with this ASCS uh, Sprint Car Series National Tour for 65 dates. It's uh, it's beating the old man up just a little bit. But uh, Mike, let's talk about let's talk a little bit about uh, what's going on in the world of NASCAR right now. I want to start off. We got a lot of things we could talk about, but I want to talk about Kirk Busch taking the ride over there at front row and the 78 car. Are you surprised that a better ride wasn't offered to Kirk Busch? No. I, I'm, I'm not because Kurt Busch is still damaged goods. Okay. I mean, people, when you say the name Kurt Busch, more times than not, what immediately comes to mind is the Jerry Punch Homestead tirade. Mm-hmm. Um, the second thing that comes to mind are his tirades on the radio and, and the way he yeah. talks and communicates with his crew. And I think that's off putting to a lot of sponsors. I've talked to a lot of team owners that want him to drive their race cars, which is surprising to me. Well, right. what's not surprising is his talent. That's that's his last thread right there. He has his mm-hmm. talent to fall back on because everything else nobody wants a part of. Sponsors don't want a part of the attitude and all the all the mouth and, and all that and neither right. do the teams, but they know he can drive a race car and that can put him or put or put that team in a in a good position. However no sponsors want to touch it, and that's why right. other race teams haven't brought him on board. Mike, um, let me let me ask you this quickly, because if he doesn't have that tirade, and I can't remember what track it was at earlier this year, if he makes it through the entire season, does all the right things, doesn't implode like he did, and I can't remember again. Darlington, wasn't it? Was it Darlington? Where he yeah. just went ballistic. I mean, absolutely lost his mind. If he makes it through this entire season, maybe opportunity, uh, a better opportunity uh, uh, comes to him because he, he kind of makes it through a season without imploding a little bit, you think? No, because, again, no. <laughs> people, people don't forget that whole Come on, Scott, situation. you know better. Well, <laughs> well, you know, I'm just trying to give the guy the benefit of the doubt. Uh, you know, well, why, well, why, on, let me Scott, ask you. Because a lot yeah. of people tried to do that. A lot yeah. of people have given Kurt Busch the benefit of the doubt. See, what a lot of people don't know is that you, Kurt Busch, back when he was with Roush Racing, Mm-hmm. He would get so angry, he'd go up in the hauler, throw a chair, and break the glass on the back wall in the hauler. I mean, he would have right. these, these these outbursts. And, you know, it got so bad, Jack Roush said, you know what I'm going to do, Kurt? I'm going to go get a baseball bat and beat the windows out in your car. How do you like it if I do that, huh? I mean, yeah. he got very volatile there at the end. <laughs> and if you remember when Kurt Busch was dismissed from Roush Fenway Racing, Jeff Smith, the president, the then president of Roush Fenway, said, we are done apologizing for Kurt Busch. Right. And... That left a lot of bad taste in a lot of people's mouths, okay? So mm-hmm. you've got the trail of Roush Fenway. Now you've got the trail of Penske Racing. And those are two top-tier teams. If you can't make a go of it there, where else can you go to make a go of it, you know? Right. I mean, how, I, how come, I hope how, how come Kyle so sorted out because he's a talented guy, but he's got a lot of demons that he needs to address. Mike, how come uh, Kyle gets the chances? Because there's a lot of people that think on the track and sometimes publicly – Kyle Busch might be worse. Personally, I, I kind of like Kyle Busch. I've had a chance to meet him at some of the short tracks when he has his late model out, and I find him engaging. Um, but he does have his moments. How come he still gets a shot and his brother doesn't? Because, he, well, first of all, he, he almost lost that shot after dumping well, one of the Texas last year in the truck race. Right. But uh, the and, point is, is and, he didn't, though, right? 
he did not. But the step short of that was they made him they made him step out of the truck, made him step out of the nationwide car, mm-hmm. except for periodic appearances that they had to approve. Kurt is worse than Kyle, to be frank, in bottom line. Kyle is, while he still may have issues or the appearance that he has issues of controlling his temper and controlling his mouth and all that, if you look at him, he doesn't stomp off from television like he used to, doesn't park the car in the middle of pit road and get out and go to the you know the motorhome and all that. Right. Believe it or not, Kyle's not as bad as Kurt, and that's why Kyle still has a top-tier ride, but he almost lost that in November of last year. All right, I'm going to steer this uh, conversation back to who's really running well right now, and that's the top, and Denny Hamlin is the most recent of those. Uh, Coming back after a down year last year, nearly winning the championship two years ago, he seems like a different person right now. He really seems like the guy that can handle the adversity and take this on to the title. Do you agree? Not yet. I'm Uh. getting there, but I'll know more on Monday because – this race on Sunday at Dover is a statement race for Denny Hamlin. If he comes in here and he walks out of here with a top five or a top ten or even a win, mm-hmm. I'm thinking that it's over and Denny Hamlin could be your guy. But Dover is one of Denny's worst racetracks, so bad, in fact, that he's had to consult the services of Bob Rotella, sports psychologist. Bob has been helping him deal with, this, with the challenges, uh, the emotional challenges that he faced after losing the title a couple of years ago. And Bob's been working with him to, to get his mind right. And Denny called Bob this week and said, hey, help me get ready for Dover. I need help because I hate this place. If he comes in here Sunday, does well, that, in my opinion, is a statement race for that 11 bunch. And that is a notice to the rest of the chase contenders. Watch out for the 11. Other than that, it's all five time and all 48 all the time. Jimmy Johnson, again, he's there. He's leading by one point. But we've seen this story written before, haven't we? Right. Yeah. What do you think the benchmark is for Hamlin this weekend? Top ten? He said top five. Top, you said top five. Mm-hmm. Top five or top ten. If you can get out of here with the fenders on it, on the lead lap and in the top ten, I think that would almost be like a win for the 11 bunch. I think Denny Hamlin, the one thing that he needs to overcome is really how his team is putting behind a little bit with the bad strategy, putting the air in the tires. I, I just can't believe at that level that, that they would have that problem during qualifying. And you can see that Denny Hamlin handled that a lot better because he kind of laughed almost about it. He did laugh, actually. And uh, so he put on the right face, and it seems like he's handling it well. Um, But his his team cannot let him down, and I think that's the most important part right now because we know he can do it. And like you say, if he gets through Dover uh, with a good run, he's got some tracks that he's pretty good at ahead of him. But uh, he's definitely going to have to worry about uh, that crew a little bit right now. That has to be in his mind just a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm sure it is. And, you know, every now and then there's a mistake made. Now, right. you can say that at the, at the top level of the series, mistakes are not acceptable. And I'm sure they're not. For instance, Matt Kenseth loses a shock. Are you kidding? Yeah, how's that who, who loses right. a shock? I mean, right. I can't remember last time a shock fall off a race car. It's those small things that obviously can, can add up to a lot. But, I want to ask you boys a question right quick, and this sure. one that we uh, that we bantered around on, on talk radio this week. You know, you talk about the crew and you talk about the team. Well, Darian Grubb is all is obviously his crew chief. Won half the chase races last year with Tony Stewart, and so far this year, five races with Denny Hamlin. From a yeah. performance perspective, not necessarily a penalized perspective, is Darian Grubb the new Chad Canals of the Spring Cup Series garage? Because it used mm. to be. Chad was the one that would run the table on everything. I'm thinking, yes, Darian Grubb, while he goes about his business business very, very very quietly, in my opinion, Darian Grubb has really stepped up the game and is probably one of the most underrated crew chiefs in that cup garage, and in my opinion, the best cup crew chief in that cup garage. Wow. That's a well, big he, statement right he there. Has, he has won a championship, so, I mean, he's got that under his belt right now. But I'm thinking maybe the next Chad Canals is possibly Paul Wolf, the crew chief for Brad Keselowski. What yeah. do you think about that? Uh, possibly. I like I like Darian better just because I of the running the table with, with the chase. It's like, mm-hmm. you know, you don't really turn on a lot in the, in the regular season, but when we get to the postseason, I mean, I can't remember the stat. Well, he won five races last year, and he's got a couple of wins, I think, 
It, it, it's like he's won six of the last ten chase races or something like that. Over it's 50%. crazy. Right, right. I, but, I'm with but, you on Darian Grubb. I, I, I'm, I'm with you Wolf, on Darian Grubb. Paul Wolf, though, Brad Keselowski's crew chief, mm-hmm. I have picked Brad to win the championship this year. Um, and I like Paul and Brad together. And I think Paul's come a long way in that Penske racing um, situation there. I think he does a great job, and I, I look for him to be a factor. I'm still I'm still saying Brad has got a shot at the title. Conceivably, it could come down to the 2, the 11, and the 48 to determine the uh, championship this year. Yeah, you know what? This leads to the question about Chad Knauss and Jimmy Johnson. Who really helps who the most there? I mean, is, is the success behind – I know everybody can say it's the combination thing, and it's w- with Hendrick Motorsports. But if Jimmy Johnson had a different crew chief or Chad Canals had a different driver, would they have the same type of success? Who benefits the most out of that relationship without going they both they, they both bring it? I mean, who do you think really is the the guy that makes that thing really happen? In the spirit of the upcoming Hollywood Casino 400 at the Kansas Speedway, I'm going to call it a push. (laughs) I think think Jimmy Johnson compliments Chad Knauss perfectly. Mm. I think Chad Knauss compliments Jimmy Johnson perfectly. But it wasn't all peaches and cream. Rick Hendrick told me a story. When Chad and Jimmy first started working together, Chad and Jimmy could not stand each other. They were at mm. each other's throats. They didn't want to work together. It was awful. Well, one day, Mr. Hendrick pulls both of them in his office. And when they walked in, they looked at Mr. Hendrick's desk, and they saw three cups of milk and three plates of cookies. <laughs> and they're like, what is this? Mr. Hendrick says in his slow, southern-drawn um, accent, and he says, boys, Since we're going to act like children, I figured we'd come in and have some milk and cookies. He says, we're going to get this worked out. He says, we're going to get this worked out today, and we're going to stay here until we do, even if we have to get three mats out, lay down for some nappy time, and then come back to the table after that. (laughs) Sit down. Let's talk. Uh, That that is a great story. That was the watershed moment for that team right there, that driver, that crew chief. After that. There were no more issues, and look at the relationship that has ensued since. So, right. so I think they both need each other. If you take Jimmy Johnson and put it with another crew chief, or you take Chad Kadass and put it with another driver, you will not mirror the success that the two have had together. So really the man who's responsible for is all Rick of that Hendrick. is Rick Hendrick, <laughs> right? Oh. Yep, you're yeah. absolutely right. Yeah. All right, uh, Mike, before we let you go, i got to ask you these questions. Wild card races. Obviously, we always know that the Super Speedway, Talladega, is one of those races. Kansas Speedway could be a bigger wild card in the chase for the championship than any track because of the new banking and the new pavement there. Would you agree? Uh, 1,000%. There are yeah. three wild card races in the chase. Talladega, Martinsville, and now right. Kansas. Because with the new pavement, and the new configuration and all that, you take your notes and you throw them away, not just from Kansas, but all the testing you've done this year and all the racing you've done on mile-and-a-half racetracks that could potentially give you some information you need at Kansas is all gone. So that's why Kansas is now a five-day weekend. We're going to start testing there on Wednesday. Test Wednesday, test Thursday, and then, of course, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday for the race weekend. So the teams are going to get some additional time but they don't have the notebook to fall back on from years past. So I think um, I think y'all are pretty fortunate there in Kansas City to have a race that a lot of people could be talking about as far as determining who becomes the champion or who does not become champion because of something that happened at that uh, at that racetrack. I'm sure you've had a chance to talk to some of the drivers that have tested there. What what is the feedback? Out, you know, because when they talk to us local media, everything's great. What are they telling the national media? Same thing. Same thing. They say that the track is smooth. Uh, they say the track is fantastic. Now, at the same time, it's going to take away a lot of the racing room because the track's not going to be rubbered in. You know, whenever you repave a racetrack, you're yeah. going to give back five years. It's going to take right. five years to get it weathered in to where that groove will widen out and we'll see some good side-by-side racing. We'll start the race with, obviously, a single-file parade. Guys will venture out and venture out. But with any repaving job, you give a little back, 
you give some of the racing back, it'll come back to Kansas. And it's something they had to do. I'll tell you, I was in my turn position for the last race there in the spring, and I'm looking down, and there were holes in the racetrack. I mean, it had to be repaid. There's no doubt about that. And kudos to Pat Warren and everybody over there at Kansas Speedway for doing that. Um, but we're going to sacrifice a little bit of the racing for a short term in order for a long-term situation. So uh, they're happy about it. Uh, they can't wait to get there. And quite frankly, I can't wait to see the Grand Am cars on the track there in 2013 on the road course. We were there for practice day. It was pretty interesting to see the road course down in the infield of Kansas Speedway. As fans and, uh, you know, citizens of that great city of Kansas City, um, we're, we're pretty excited to see what the new veritable banking will bring. We're hopeful that the groove will widen out a little quicker because of the banking. And uh, we, we saw it down there at Homestead. You know, they went too wide pretty quick with that banking down there. So we're we're hopeful that will happen. But we all know that. You've got to put some laps on it. You've got to wear out the bottom and work your way up as the track wears out. And the only thing that I'm really concerned about, Mike, is that everybody I talk to, this new pavement that they're putting down at these tracks like Michigan and and Las Vegas doesn't seem to wear out as quick as the old pavement. So it it takes a little longer to get that groove worked in. It does. But here's uh, here's what I'm hoping will happen at, uh, at Kansas there. I know when they did the repave at Phoenix, they basically had every type of vehicle they could get on that track just laying rubber. They had racing schools. They had they had trucks dragging tires around the track yeah. for days, for hours, for weeks, getting that getting as much rubber built into that racetrack as possible. I'm hoping that they do the same thing at Kansas, where they are. You know, they are doing that. Oh, they are. Well, that's great. Yeah, news. we we saw we were out there a week ago, Mike, and they had a big called the tire dragon, the tire dragon. They were out there dragging tires, so they're they're doing it right now. Yeah, and the Richard Petty experience is going to be out there as well. And then we've got Architest this week, so a lot of laps are going to be made on that track. And by Cup weekend, by the time Sunday rolls around, you got to think about it. you've got two days of practice: Wednesday, Thursday, Arca race on Friday, Nationwide Series on Saturday, and then come Cup time. I'm hopeful that it's laid down a little rubber up in the second lane. While I'm sure you need rain, let's hope it doesn't come that week and wash all no that doubt. rubber off the racetrack. <laughs> yeah. How dare you, Mike? Please. That's right. <laughs> hey, Mike, want to get your thoughts about We lost an icon yesterday, Chris Economaki. Uh, I mean, he this guy was everything to motorsports. Uh, your thoughts? Chris Economaki will never be replaced. You will never find another person who mastered print, radio, and television. Chris spent some time with us at Motor Racing Network uh, before, obviously, he went on to do television. And Chris had such the reach that even Bill France Sr. back in the day recognized his importance. Um, He recognized it from the standpoint of when ABC came to NASCAR and said, hey, we we want to air some of your races, Bill France Sr. said, then we're going to use Chris Economaki then. They're like, why? He says, with all due respect, our sport is best when it's talked about and described by someone who knows automobile racing, not a stick and ball guy. With all due respect to Jack Fleming, with all due respect to Keith Jackson, who are legendary broadcasters in their own right, they just don't understand or get automobile racing. Mm-hmm. So Bill Sr. said, Chris Economaki is your guy. That's, that's how you saw um, Chris Economaki on you know, the wide world of sports, doing the telecast that he did, and obviously that turned into uh, his tenure at CBS. Uh, Of course, you know, starting National Speed Sport News, the publication back in the 1930s. Chris gave me some great advice one time. And, you know, he had, again, with all due respect, he did not have the the GQ face for television. (laughs) He had the knowledge that no one else did, and that's what got Chris a long way. He said, he stopped me one day, young man, I appreciate your play-by-play on radio, but let me give you some advice. When you ask a question, ask a question. Don't ask a statement. I said, well, what do you mean? He says, I heard you the other day walk up to Richard Petty and say, man, that was a good run. You had it over. He says, that's not a question. That's a statement. Your question should have been, Richard, you had a great run at Dover. What made it so great? Ask a pointed question. You'll always get a definitive answer. And I have yep, taken uh, that with me. He told me that years ago. And I took that with me uh, and still and still treasure that to this day. And every time I actually ask a question, 
I always make sure I ask a question and not ask a statement because of the advice of Chris Economac. He's touched a lot of lives, no doubt. Um, yeah. And and a, a lot of people respected him. A lot of people, quite frankly, didn't like him. But he was fair, and he was to the point. He always said, you know what, make your question, go for your big question, and make it short because you want to get to the answer. People are waiting for the answer. They're not waiting for your question. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic yeah. Good advice. advice. Well, on that note, we're going to let you get out of here, Mike. Thanks so much for being on the show. Hope we'll have you back by uh, the end of the season, maybe talk about uh, who won the championship in 2012. Thanks for everything, and uh, I love your show, man. Love what you guys do over there. Appreciate it. You got the number? Stay in touch. Anytime you need me, just give me a call. All right, Thanks, Mike. Mike. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, boy. Mike Bagley from Sirius uh, XM Radio and uh, Channel 90. And the Bag Man. The morning Drive. Yep, you can hear him uh on uh, 1510 ESPN for the race tomorrow at Dover mm-hmm. and uh, all the coverage right there. All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, Dan Robinson, the general manager of Lucas Oil Speedway, joins us, the Racing Boys on Sports Radio 810 WHB.